السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلا علیہ وصحاب اجمعین اما بعد مائی برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز آئی ویلکم ٹو یو ٹو دس سیشن ٹوڈے وی ول لک ایٹ دا انٹروڈکشن ٹو حدیث اینڈ دا امپارٹنس آف دا حدیث وی نو دیٹ دیر آر ٹو پرائمری سورسز آف دا ریلیجن آف اسلام دیٹ از دا قرآن اینڈ دا حدیث ہاؤ ایور among muslims we find there are four different attitudes regarding hadith the first attitude we find there are some muslims who accept everything that comes in the name of hadith you give them any hadith sahi zaif mauzu anything in the name of hadith it is on their eyes and on their foreheads sar aakho par as it said in urdu everything is accepted but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man kadaba alayya mutamidan Whoever lies in my name knowingly, he makes for himself a seat in the fire of hell. If anyone lies in the name of the Prophet, it is not accepted. It is not respectable. It is rejected. It is a sin, such a serious sin. It gets for that person a place, a booking in the fire of hell. And he also prophesies, as in a hadith recorded in Sahih Muslim, hadith number 7. He said, at the end of the times there will be some people who will come they will be frauds, liars they will come with such a hadith which you nor your fathers had ever heard meaning it's never heard in the Islamic tradition in the 1400 years of Islamic history they've never been there they will come with such hadith beware of them keep them away from you and you stay away from them they should not be able to misguide you they should not be able to put you into trials so the Prophet ﷺ prophesied that there will be people who will lie in the name of the Prophet ﷺ. and this happened there are people who have been caught out lying in the name of the Prophet ﷺ. so this first attitude of accepting everything in the name of the hadith this is a wrong attitude inshallah we will be looking at today how a hadith becomes sahi zaif mazu in a very brief nutshell it's a brief overview of the subject the second attitude is another extreme on one extreme are those people who say they accept everything in the name of the hadith on the second extreme are people who reject everything in the name of the hadith they say no quran is enough for us but this attitude is wrong There are explicit and clear proofs which give an answer to this understanding among people. Inshallah, today we will be looking at six reasons why this understanding of rejecting everything in the name of the Hadith is wrong. Thirdly, there are some people who accept some Hadith and they reject some Hadith. But this accepting and rejecting is not on the basis of the proof. It's rather on what they like and what they don't like. what they can understand, what they don't understand, what goes according to their understanding of the Quran or goes against their understanding of the Quran. So they will not see whether the Hadith chain of narration is connected or there's some liar who has lied in the name of the Prophet ﷺ. They will not see that there's a person with very bad memory. They will only say, I like this Hadith and they will take it and we don't like this Hadith so we will reject it. So what will happen? Certain Hadiths which are not authentic will get accepted. And certain hadiths which are authentic will get rejected. So obviously this understanding is wrong due to many reasons. I will give you only one reason from the Quran, the words of Iblis. As mentioned in Surah Araf, Surah 7 verse 12. Allah says that when Iblis was asked why you did not prostrate before Adam, he said, Ana minhu, min wa min teen. He said, oh Allah, I am better than him. You created me from fire and created him from clay. Meaning clay, it is something which is of a lowly thing. If you even throw clay, it goes down and fire goes up. So why should I bow down to him, O Allah? I am made from fire. You made me from fire and made him from clay. But he was wrong. He should have surrendered his aql before the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the command of Allah has come and Allah is Al-Aleem, He knows you are made of fire. He, Allah knows He is made of clay. He is all knowledgeable. He is Al-Hakim, all wise. He is Al-Khabir, all aware. He knows everything. He has told you. Now you have to surrender your aql 
and just fulfill the command of Allah. This brings us that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what wahi he got and what he spoke on the basis of this wahi, what he spoke, which is recorded in the books of Hadith. This is not something from his own desires. This is something which is based on the wahi from Allah subhanahu wa taala. As Allah has said in the Quran in Surah 53, verse 3, "Wa ma yantaqo anil hawa." The Prophet does not speak from his desire. In huwa illa wa yun yuha. This is a wahi revealed to him. This is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa taala. This has come from Allah subhanahu wa taala. Now we have wahi of two forms. Wahi matlu, which is read, recited. We get the reward for the recitation. That is the Quran. And we have wahi ghair matlu, wahi which does not carry the reward for the recitation. It carries the reward for sharing the knowledge, for acting on the command, which is there in the hadith. Now all of this is based on wahi. Now where is the aql? Our aql is where? Is it above the Quran and the hadith? Is this the place? Is it the same level as the Quran and the hadith? No. The place for aql is below the Quran and the hadith. To understand the Quran and the Hadith, we use Aql, but we know where it stands. What is the position of the Aql? We will not do the mistake which Iblis did. Religion is not based on Aql and what we like and what we don't like because we may like something which is bad and we may dislike something which is good. And Allah knows and we don't know. So my dear brothers and sisters, this third attitude is also wrong. And as we go ahead, inshallah, you will understand this better and better today. And the fourth attitude, the right attitude, is accepting that which is proven and rejecting that which is not proven according to the rules which are from the Quran, from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Based on that, the muhaddithin have the rules for checking the hadith. Inshallah, we will be looking at this today. But before we start, we need to first look at what really is included in the word hadith. What is the hadith? So we see scholars have defined this as Al Hadith Ma Dhukiran in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hadith is that which has been narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Qawlin, from his sayings, what he said. So repeat with me, Qawl, from what he said. For example, in Namal Amalu bin Niyat, deeds according to the intention. Aw Failin, or what he did, his actions. For example, we find descriptions of the Salah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is his action, there's no statement there. This is his action, Sahaba seeing and describing to us, this is how the Prophet ﷺ prayed. Min qawlin aw failin aw taqreerin. Approval of the Prophet ﷺ. What was done in front of him and he approved of it. This is the third thing, approvals of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, it is recorded in Sahih Bukhari, in front of the Prophet ﷺ, people ate a bob, the desert lizard. And the Prophet ﷺ did not stop them. Shows if it was wrong, as the Prophet of Allah, he cannot stay quiet. See, you and I can stay quiet. We may be considering it bad in our heart. That's also a level of Iman, a lower level of Iman, which is permissible. In certain circumstances, a person may do that. But the Prophet ﷺ, as the Messenger of Allah, he had to pass on. He cannot stay quiet. So when he cannot stay quiet, if he stayed quiet, meaning there's nothing wrong in it. It's an approval of the Prophet ﷺ. It's not a call, it's not a statement because he's quiet. It's not an action because he didn't do anything. It's someone else doing in front of the Prophet ﷺ and him being quiet on it is an approval of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the third type. Aw taqreerin. Aw sifatin khalqiyah. Or the physical characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ. How was his hair? How was his face? How was his body? These physical characteristics, these are not actions. These are physical characteristics. This is also included in the hadith. Fifth, aw khuluqiyya, or his character. Now his character is described as Aisha radilanha, describes that his character was the Quran. So characteristics of his character which are described, this is the fifth thing included in hadith. And sixth is seerah, his biography, whether before prophethood or after prophethood. So things which happened at his time, events which happened before prophethood, after prophethood. Now these are also included in our hadith and this is also which is included, the six things which are included in hadith. It's easy. Let us repeat once. Min qawlin, whether his speech, aw failin, his actions, aw taqreerin, his approvals, 
او صفت خلقیہ او فزیکل کیریکٹرسٹکس او خلقیہ ڈسکرپشن آف اس کیریکٹر او سیرا اور ہز بایوگرافی ود دا بیفور پروفٹ ہڈ اور افٹر پروفٹ ہڈ ناؤ وی ول سی ا حدیث فرام ویئر اٹ از نریٹڈ میننگ ہوز نریشن از دس دیر آر فور کیٹیگریز براڈلی اسپیکنگ فرسٹ حدیث قدسی which is a narration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the last narrator in the chain of narration is the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself who is narrating from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is wahi ghair matlu a wahi which is not having the reward of tilawat recitation but this is wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hadith qudusi when it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who says the words of this hadith would be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this this is the first category Second is Marfu. Marfu, as the Muhaddisin have seen the chain of narration, they see on top of the chain is the Prophet Wasallam. They have visualized it as if there are stairs which are leading up to the top position. Marfu means raised. This is a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. Then there is a hadith Mawquf. Mawquf means that which is stopped, which didn't reach right till the top. It stopped short of reaching the top. And that is a narration from a Sahabi. It is also called an Athar. Plural is Athar. A statement from a Sahabi. It is called Mawquf Hadith. So now for example, whenever we hear any scholar say that this Hadith is Mawquf, I request all of you viewers to memorize this. Hadith Qudusi, a Hadith from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Marfu Hadith is a Hadith from a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mawquf Hadith is a Hadith from a Sahabi. And Maqtu. Maqto means that which is cut off, which is broken. Meaning that is a narration from a tabai. A tabai is narrating. It's a statement of the tabai. It's called maqto. If it's a statement of a sahabi, it's called mawkuf. If it's a statement of the Prophet ﷺ, it's called marfo. If it's a statement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's called hadith qudusi. Now we come to the next section. That is the authority and importance of the hadith. My brothers and sisters, this is a big confusion. in today's intellectual times when some people on the basis of certain intellectual thought processes have come to an understanding we don't need the hadith only the quran is enough is it so let's see what the quran says first we see there are so many verses in the quran which say atiullah wa atiur rasul obey allah and obey the messenger clearly and distinctly there are two different entities mentioned obey allah and obey the messenger The messenger doesn't speak from his own self. The hadith which he is narrating is under revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second proof is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the explainer of the Quran. We agree and accept that the Quran is preserved. Not only is the Quran preserved, even the explanation of the Quran is preserved. Please see this verse of the Quran. Allah says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ ذِكْرَ I have sent down to you this message. لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ So that you explain to people what I have sent down. So the role of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not that of a postman. How a postman or a courier comes and delivers a parcel and goes away. That is the job of the courier. That's the job of the postman. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not only conveying and passing on the message of Allah. He is also the explainer of the Quran. Read this verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has said, لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ So that you explain to people. تُبَيِّنَ comes from tabin, tabin, mubin, makes clear. They all come from the same root. It means that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will make clear. Allah said, أَقِمِ الصَّلَى Offer salah. How to offer salah? Allah says, give zakat. How to give zakat? Allah says, fast. How to start fasting? Allah says, go for hajj. How to do hajj? The Prophet ﷺ explained the scope of the verses of the Qur'an. When the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, forbidden for you is dead meat and blood, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ explained to us what are the exceptions in this rule. Allah has said dead meat is haram, but there are two types of dead animals which are halal, fish and locust. He mentioned in a clear-cut hadith. So this is part of the explanation of the Prophet ﷺ. So, لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And so that they may ponder. Pondering is after getting the explanation from our beloved Prophet ﷺ. The third reason which clearly points to the preservation of the hadith 
is that the laws of this religion, halal and haram, are not contained only in the Quran. They are also in the ahadith. And Allah has pointed to this in Surah Hashr, Surah 59, verse 7. Allah says, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُزُوهُ Whatever the Prophet gives, you take it. وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ أَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever he stops you from, stop from it. Whatever he has stopped you from, stop from it. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ explained so many things. For example, silk is haram for men. Nowhere mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned in the Hadith. Gold is haram for men. Not mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned in the Hadith. So do we say that the laws, the halal and haram of this religion, are they preserved? When we say they are preserved, so it is obvious that the Hadith is also preserved. So the first reason is, all the ayat which talk of Atiyu Rasul, obedience of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of these ayat are proofs that it is Allah who will make sure that the statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are preserved so that the last person who comes in the times just before the Day of Judgment, even he can do Atiyu Rasul the way we all can and the Sahaba could do Atiyu Rasul because the statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are preserved by the power, will and the greatness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ is the explainer of the Qur'an. He has given the explanation of the Qur'an. When the Qur'an is preserved, isn't the explanation of the Qur'an preserved? Thirdly, the halal and the haram of this religion, the lawful and the prohibited of this religion are preserved. This deen is preserved. This religion is preserved. And this religion is contained not only in the Qur'an, it is also contained in the Hadith. Fourth reason, the Prophet ﷺ is the role model for us. He is the example for us. What has Allah said in the Quran? Surah 33, verse 21. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of Allah the best pattern of conduct. My brothers and sisters, how can we have him as a role model if nothing about him is preserved? If only the Quran is preserved, then how can we follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How can we imitate him? How can we try to be like him? As a comparison, as a contrast, I will give you an example. In Encyclopedia Britannica, in the 14th edition, it is mentioned under the section of Jesus Christ, it is mentioned that biblical scholars state that the attempt to write the biography of Jesus should frankly be abandoned. For the material for that does not exist. It has been estimated that the total number of days about which we have any information does not exceed 40. What do biblical scholars state? They say, how can we structure the biography of Jesus Christ with such limited information? So the attempt to write the biography of Jesus should frankly be abandoned. But my brothers and sisters, the biography of the Prophet ﷺ has not only been written, it is present with chains of narration. We can see even small things about how he used to sleep with his hand below his cheek, how he used to eat with three fingers, how he used to walk, how he used to talk, how he used to do musafaha and never take his hand back first. All of these smallest attributes we find of our beloved Prophet ﷺ so much that it is possible to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ and have him as a practical role model and as an example for all of us. Reason number five. You remember the verse from the Quran which we have seen earlier, Surah Nisa, Surah 4, 59, where Allah has mentioned about solving differences, solving ikhtilaf. There Allah has mentioned, فَإِن تَنَازَاتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ If you differ in any matter, فَرُدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُ Then refer to Allah and His Messenger. Meaning refer to the Quran and the Sunnah. We have to refer to both of them to solve our differences. As Allah has said that, فَرُدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُ Refer to Allah and His Messenger. My brothers and sisters, how can we solve our differences if the hadiths are not preserved? Because someone will say, okay, I understand this from the Quran. I understand this from the Quran. Everyone will come with his own understanding and interpretation based on his own assumptions and his own aql, his own intelligence and whatever he perceives. But the right way is to understand, as explained by the Prophet ﷺ, the Quran and the Sunnah put together. And along with that, the understanding of the followers, the best followers, the Sahaba, the Salaf, as we have seen, this helps us to solve differences. And last reason, the sixth reason which I share with you is to avoid deviation, avoid going astray. 
as the Prophet ﷺ said in a famous hadith, which I have mentioned earlier, I'm not going to spend too much time on this right now. He said, Taraktu fikum shayain. I leave behind among you two things. Lam tadillu ba'dahuma. After these two, you will not go astray. Kitabullah wa sunnati. It is the book of Allah and my sunnah. Balayya tafarraqa. Khata yarida alayya al-hawd. And these two are not going to be separated until they meet me at the house. My brothers and sisters, these two are not going to be separated. And after these two, we won't go astray. And what are these two? The Quran and the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet ﷺ. These six are sufficient reasons for anyone to understand that Allah SWT has said, Atiyu Rasul. So Allah will preserve the statements of the Messenger. Allah has said that the Prophet ﷺ is the explainer of the Quran. So Allah will preserve the Quran. Allah has said that the laws of Islam, the halal and haram, whatever the Prophet gives, take it. Whatever he stops you from, stop from it. So the statements of the Prophet ﷺ will be preserved by Allah SWT. Allah has made the Prophet ﷺ as an example to be followed. Not a namesake, symbolic figure, but a real example whom we can do ittiba, whom we can follow, whom we can love, whom we can take as a role model. So Allah will preserve the statements of the Prophet. Allah has mentioned that in matters of differences, refer to Allah and His Messenger. So we have to refer to Allah and His Messenger to solve our differences. So Allah will preserve the statements of the Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah Rasul Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned that Lam tadillu ba'dahuma. After these two, you won't go astray. To be on guidance, we need both of these, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now from here, this point onwards, we start a little technical section. And my brothers and sisters, I want to introduce the science of Hadith to you so that we are able to understand and fully appreciate the character of Islam as a preserved religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, any Hadith which we mention, it actually consists of two parts. The first part is the Sanad and the second part is the Matan. Sanad is the chain of narration. Chain of narration. For example, we have a Hadith in front of us. It's a hadith recorded in Sahih Bukhari. Imam Bukhari is saying, Haddathana Muhammad ibn Bashar. Ki Muhammad ibn Bashar narrated to Imam Bukhari. What? Qal haddathana Yahya bin Sayyid. He says that Yahya bin Sayyid narrated to him, Muhammad bin Bashar. He says Yahya bin Sayyid narrated to him. What? Qal haddathana Shu'ba. Shu'ba narrated to him. What? Qal haddathni Abu Tayyah. Abu Tayyah narrated to him. What? An Anas ibn Malik. That Anas ibn Malik said what? And in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Qala yassiru wa la wa la tunafiru. Make things easy, don't make them difficult. Give good news, don't turn them away. Now this is the matan, the text of the hadith starts from Qala. Yassiru, this is the text of the hadith. Yassiru wa la tuassiru, bashiru wa la tunafiru. What we see before that is the chain of narration. Now my brothers and sisters, this chain of narration is the beauty of of Islam that we find the statements of the Prophet ﷺ coming down to us with chains of narration. For example, when we look at Musnad Ahmad, we find all the ahadith from the Sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah bin Amr bin Alas He has copied 70 pages from the book of Abdullah bin Amr bin Alas but he has copied with a chain of narration that this thing was narrated to me by so and so, so and so, so and so. Now we find that they had this meticulous system. For example, when the Sahifa Sadiqa of Hammam ibn Munabbi, the student of Abu Huraira, when this was discovered, it is still there in the museum in France. All the hadith in the manuscript of Hammam ibn Munabbi, the student of Abu Huraira, are found in Sahih Bukhari. So what did these muhaddisin do? They compiled the hadith from earlier scattered sources into major compilations. But they had the system of maintaining the chain of narration. This is the sunnah. For example, we find that I am sending a parcel to another city. So there is a person, a pickup boy who comes, picks up the parcel. He goes and takes it to his office. From the office, there is another person who loads it in a truck and takes it to the airport. From the airport, there is another person who takes it and loads it into the aircraft. From the aircraft, it goes to the next city where another person takes it from the aircraft and takes it to the local office. And from that office, there's another delivery boy who takes that parcel from the, from the office and delivers it to the destination. Now, this is a chain. If there's any break in the chain, the parcel is lost. Now, we need to understand, my brothers and sisters, that these ahadis come to us with a chain of narration. Broadly speaking, 
Wahadisin have said that there are hadith of four types. First is Sahih. Sahih means it is authentic. What are the conditions of Sahih? We are just going to see. Second is Hasan. Hasan is good. It is also acceptable. What is the difference between Sahih and Hasan? We will shortly see, inshallah. Third is Zaif. Zaif is weak. Among the Zaif hadith, some hadith go to the level of Mawzu, which means fabricated. So we have mentioned this separately. Now, what should we do with the fabricated hadith? Where liars have narrated, obviously we don't have to accept it. What do we do with the Zaif hadith? The weak hadith. Weak meaning, after compiling all the chains of narration, there is a certain doubt, did the Prophet ﷺ say this or did not say this? Now what do we do? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah 17, verse 36, وَلَا تَقْفُوا مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ Do not follow that of which you have no knowledge. What you don't have knowledge, don't follow. Allah says, it's not confirmed. We don't follow it. Prophet ﷺ said, in a hadith recorded in Sunan Tirmidhi with authentic chain of narration, he said, da ma yuribuk ila ma la yuribuk. Leave that in which there is doubt. For that in which there is no doubt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the Jews and the Christians, ma lahum bihim in ilm, illa tiba zan. They don't have any confirmed knowledge. They only follow assumptions. We don't follow assumptions. Inna zanna la yughni min al haqi shayya. Assumptions don't stand in front of the haqq. They don't stand in front of the truth. We follow the truth. We don't follow assumptions. And this is a rule in Islamic fiqh, Islamic sharia, that whatever is not confirmed, we don't follow. For example, when we look for the moon, and you get a feeling that the moon should be there behind the clouds. Will we declare that the month has started? Will we declare that, okay, fasting has started, or Eid has come? No. Until you don't see, it's not counted. It's not counted. Maybe there is not counted. Have you seen it? Did anybody see it? Are there any witnesses? If there are no witnesses, it's not confirmed, it's not proven, it's not acceptable. For example, you're offering salah and you get a feeling that some gas has passed. Did you hear any sound? Did you get any smell? If no, it's not confirmed. If it's confirmed, you have to leave salah, you have to go into wudu and come back. If it's not, then you continue with the salah. This is what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. So this is a consistent rule in Islam that we don't follow that which is not confirmed. What is confirmed, we follow that. And due to that reason, instead of putting a question mark on the Zaif Hadith, we have put a cross. Even the Zaif Hadith are not to be followed according to the authentic opinion from the Muhaddisin, based on the proofs from the Quran and the Sunnah and the plenty of evidences. We don't follow assumptions. We follow that which is confirmed. Now we come to the question, how does a Hadith become Sahih? Some people think that, oh, it is that the Muhaddisin say, oh, I like this Hadith, this is Sahih. I don't like this Hadith, this is Zaif. It's not based on what the Muhaddis likes or doesn't like. It's based on a science and this science is based on the Quran and the Sunnah. For example, Allah says in the Quran in Surah 49, Surah Hujurat, verse 6, Allah says, Ya yu alladheena amanu, O you who believe, in jaakum fasiqum binabain fatabayanu. If a fasiq comes to you with some news, check it up. Meaning some fasiq, some evildoer comes to you with some news, check it up. What if some reliable person comes to you with some news? Then accept it. This is understood. If some fasik comes to you with some news, then check it. You can't accept it. So my brothers and sisters, this is one of the basis of the science of hadith. We start with the section, how does a hadith become sahih? First reason, the chain of narration should be muttasil. The full chain of narration should be connected there should be no disconnection in the chain. The disconnection is called inqita. There should be no inqita in the chain. The chain should be muttasil. It should be fully connected. As we saw from the example of the parcel, the courier parcel which we sent. You, I hope you remember. So the chain should be connected. There should be no disconnection anywhere. Point number one. Point number two. Now imagine the whole chain is connected, but it is full of liars. Now what? So the second thing is, that every narrator should be Adil. Adil meaning he should be good in religion. He should be reliable. He should be trustworthy. He should not be a liar. He should not be a cheat. He should not be a fasik. As Allah said, in jaakum fasikum bin fatabayanu. He should not be a fasik. So this is point number two. How do we check he's an Adil? We will shortly see, inshallah. Third, 
He is a reliable person. He is a truthful person. He is a religious person. He is not a fraud. He is not a cheat. He is not a liar. But what if his memory is not good? If his memory is not good, then what? Will we accept his statement? No. So he should also be zabit, meaning his preservation should be good. Now there are two types of preservation: zabt fil sadru and zabt fil kitab. If he is memorizing, did he memorize properly? If he has written and kept, did he write it properly and keep it? So his preservation should be good, meaning not only should he be trustworthy, he should also have good preservation. So there may be a liar with good preservation, won't do. There may be a trustworthy person with bad preservation, won't do. We need a trustworthy person with reliable preservation. That is what we need. And a narrator who's adil and zabit, he's called thika. He's called thika. In short, so when muhaddithin say this narrator is thika, meaning he's reliable, he's adil and zabit both. Now tell me one thing, brothers and sisters. If the chain of narration is muttasil, please repeat with me so that you can memorize. If the chain of narration is muttasil, if it's connected, if every narrator is adil, if every narrator is zabit, but he's adil, he's truthful, he's zabit, his preservation is good, but he's a human being. And human beings can make mistakes even when they are reliable. A reliable person also can make mistakes. And Kullu ibn Adam Khattah, narrated by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that every son, child of Adam makes mistakes. Now what? How do we catch that out? Allah has preserved this religion. We will act on that hadith. Now how can we be sure that this hadith is really authentic? So do you know? Subhanallah, the science of hadith also contains a science wherein all the chains of narration are collected together. All the chain of narration. Now, for example, the Prophet ﷺ narrated. At times, there are many Sahaba. For example, you heard that hadith. Man mutamidan min nar. Whoever lies in my name, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever lies in my name makes for himself a seat in the fire of hell. This hadith has been narrated by 63 companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So at times, there are many Sahaba. At times, there are fewer. At times, there's only one. Now, that Sahabi is narrating to Tabain. At times there are many Tabain, at times there are fewer. So now the chain of narration continues, and at times one hadith comes to us with as many as 600 chains. So, Muhaddisin, they compile these chains. After they compile, they get a comparative science, Allah Akbar. And this science is so amazing, I'm just going to give you a small glimpse into this science. My brothers and sisters, to complete this list of conditions, of a Sahih Hadith, there's a fourth thing which is called the Hadith should not be Shahs. Shahs meaning if the Hadith narrator is Adil and Zabit both, but he's a human being, his Hadith should not contradict with the narration of many narrators, more numerous than him, or more reliable narrators. Meaning what? His Hadith should not contradict with other narrators. This is a very important condition. For a hadith to be graded as sahih, it should not be shahad. I'll give you an example, and this is an amazing example. We find that the Prophet ﷺ once led people in salah, in asr salah, and instead of reading four rakats, he read two rakats. When he finished his two rakats, he finished his askar, he walked towards the back. One of the sahabi, Dhul Yadain, he was called. He walked to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked a question. See this. He said, salah, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, has salah been made short? I'm nasit, or have you forgotten? So the Prophet said, Kullu lam yakun. None of these. He said, None of these. Meaning, salah has not been made short and I have not forgotten. It is obvious that a person who has forgotten will not remember the count because he has genuinely forgotten. So then the Prophet went and asked others. And said, Asadaqa Zul Yadain. What Zul Yadain is saying, is it correct? And they all confirmed, Naam. Yes, O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed two more rakats and did two sajdas for sahu, for forgetting. Now, all praise to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala who made the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam example for us. What would we do if we forget? So Allah made the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forget so that we know what to do. However, we learn one principle from this incident. We learn that the Prophet ﷺ was surely reliable. There's no doubt about him being reliable. But he, as a human being, made an error 
and the others confirmed and this confirmation is an example of Shah's is an example of Shah's at times there's a reliable narrator he's honest he's truthful but he's a human being he can make a mistake and his narration contradicts more narrators or a narrator with higher grading than what then that narration is left because it's Shah's and lastly the fifth condition that the hadith should not be mu'allal meaning there should be no hidden defect in the hadith for example if a person is sick and he has a cold now do his hands disappear or do his feet disappear when he has a cold no they are there the hands are where they are but the cold is inside it's not visible from outside outside he looks normal but inside he has a cold similar is the matter of illa of a hadith being mu'allal if a hadith has certain hidden defects, there are some expert muhaddisin who can catch that out. They can catch that out that this hadith has some hidden defects which are not initially visible. But when that thing is found, people say, oh, this is the defect in this hadith. It's always there. But some expert muhaddisin can catch this kind of a hidden defect. Now, this defect is actually from what has already been discussed. Either there's a break in the chain, the chain is not muttasil, or the narrator is not adil, or not zabit, or the hadith is shahs. One of these four, but it is hidden. And an expert muhaddis can catch it out. There are several examples of this, and there are several such observations from seniors, expert muhaddisin, who observed at a certain time, and they said this hadith is not authentic, and later people found the reasons why it is not authentic, which is known to the expert eye. So these are five things, five conditions, that a hadith has to pass through to get the grade of sahih. How easily we say this hadith is sahih, but how many stages and scrutiny and difficulty it has to go through to reach the grade of sahih. Now we look at how do we come to know that this narrator is adil or not. There are five conditions to check the adala, the religious reliability of a narrator. First, he should never, never, never have lied in the name of the Prophet ﷺ. Lying in the name of the Prophet, fabricating a hadith is such a major sin. It's such a serious defect in that narrator that even if he has done it once in his lifetime, Every single narration that is found from that narrator gets graded as mawzu fabricated because he has been caught out, he has been identified as a liar who lied in the name of the Prophet And lying in the name of the Prophet is not acceptable. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet warned of hellfire for lying deliberately in the name of the Prophet This is a very serious matter. This is the first serious, most serious defect. And if the narrator has this defect, Every single narration from that narrator gets graded as mawzu. Second, if he has been found to lie in normal worldly matters, in his dealings, in his business, in his statements, and we have this with authentic chain of narrations right to the narrator from the muhaddis in the books of Rijal. People don't know about this. That we don't only have the books of Hadith, we also have the books of Rijal where we have statements about these narrators with chains of narration that has he been caught out lying in worldly matters. Is he a liar known to lie? So if he has been known to lie, if he is a liar, then all his ahadith are graded as matruk. Matruk means left. These ahadith cannot be used to strengthen each other and to reach the level of reliability. These are tarki, we meaning left out. These are matruka hadith if he is lying in worldly matters. The first type is if he has lied in the name of the Prophet ﷺ, this is a very serious defect. Second is if he has lied in worldly matters, he is known to be a liar, his hadith are matruk. Third, if he is a farsik, if he is known, if he is known to do major sins, or persist in minor sins openly, which takes them to the level of major. So we see, my brothers and sisters, that this person is not reliable. He's an alcoholic, he's a gambler, he's a person who is known to do major sins, a zani, an adulterer. How can his hadith be reliable? Who is not honest to his own creator? Who has not really surrendered his will before his creator? How can we depend on such a person for a hadith from him if he's known to be a farsik? This is the third defect. Fourth, if he is unknown, for example, there may be someone whose name is also not known. Jahalatul Ain. His name is also not known. Who is he? A person says, a person from this tribe narrated this hadith. Now, who is that person? We don't even know his name. Who is he? Reliable, unreliable. 
or if he is a person whose hal is not known jahalatul hal his hal is not known or if he is a person whose hal is not known his condition is not known whose name is known that he is abdullah now which abdullah is he which abdullah is he is he a reliable abdullah which abdullah is he who is he we don't know now if he is unknown how can we accept his statement some people argue about this they say no if he is not known still we should accept we ask them okay tell me if you have to leave your bag your parcel with a unknown person on the street unknown person on the station he says give me your bag i will take care of your bag will you give your bag to him and obviously no why he is unknown being unknown is raising a big question mark in times when they have been fabricators they have been liars now whether he is a fabricator a liar or a reliable person how do we know he is unknown this is reason enough for this to cause injury jarh injury to his adala to his religious reliability fourth type fifth he should not be a person of bid'a who is narrating a hadith in support of his bid'a which no other reliable person has narrated so these are five conditions if these five things are there it jars it mars it injures the reliability the adala the religious reliability of that person let's repeat first he should have never lied in the name of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam second he should not be known to be a liar in worldly matters third he should not be a fasik whose fisk is open and known to people fourth he should not be a person who's unknown and fifth he should not be a person of bid'a narrating a hadith in support of his bid'a which no other reliable person has narrated now these are things which injure their religious reliability the adala now we see what causes injury to the zabt of the narrator my brothers and sisters now we come back to the amazing thing which i wanted to share with you when scholars of hadith start looking at the different chains of narration they start seeing certain trends for example there's a teacher who is narrating a hadith there is a group of 10 people who are narrating this hadith from that same teacher nine are mentioning one thing one of the students is mentioning something else so it is obvious that when this teacher narrated this hadith in this manner then how did this student turn something else this shows that he made a mistake for example you know the famous hadith about the seven under the shade of the throne among the narrations there's one particular narration all the narrators have mentioned that what the right hand gives the left hand doesn't come to know but there's one particular narration which says that what the left hand has given the right hand doesn't come to know now what is this this is a case where the scholars have identified that this is a mistake by this narrator this is what the right hand gives the left hand doesn't come to know it happens now suppose for example a speaker may say during his talk the ground will give us rain the sky will give us the crops when it's the other way around it does happen with human beings for example suppose there is a invitation there is a daawat there is a feast and there is biryani in the feast out of 10 narrators 9 are saying there was only biryani served nothing else at all only biryani and one is saying there was some biryani and there was some korma now maybe he ate the korma somewhere else and he has mixed up we can understand nine people are mentioning that there was only biryani and nothing else at all and he is the only one who saying yes there was korma also this is a case where we can understand now the scholars of hadith they compare the chain of narrations and after comparing the chain of narrations they can identify that this is a mistake if he makes one mistake okay happens with human beings few mistakes happens with human beings but if his mistakes are more then what happens he is graded as a weak narrator in terms of preservation they can compare his narrations with other chains of narration and come to know how accurate is he how frequently he makes mistakes they can identify his mistakes they can reduce his grading now he is counted as a weak narrator but what if he makes mistakes but not so many then he is hasan he is good hasan but if his weakness is more some scholars have even said that even if he is accurate up to 60% of the time still he is weak some scholars have said this some scholars have said if majority of his narrations are weak he is considered to be a weak narrator now with this comparative analysis scholars are able to give us this information which tells us how is his reliability zabt of the narrator first if he has soul hives he is known to have bad memory he is known to have bad memory then this causes jarh to his zabt 
to his reliability in terms of preservation. Second, if he has done frequent mistakes, foshul galat, frequent non-clear open mistakes, see once in a way, it's acceptable as a human being. But in comparative analysis, they found frequently this narrator is making mistakes. Now this causes jar to his reliability. He is now not considered reliable if he makes frequent mistakes. I hope you have understood both of these. Number one, bad memory. Number two, frequent mistakes. Third, fushul gaflat, major negligence. In narrating a hadith, other narrators are narrating the hadith in a particular way and he is missing out something very, very important. And this is changing the sense and the meaning of the hadith. If there is major negligence from the narrator, fushul gaflat, then this is considered something which mars, which causes injury to his reliability in preservation. For example, it happens with us that there's a person who's present in the class, but he phases out in between, he's lost in thoughts, and then by the time he comes back, he has lost out some very important information in the lecture. This happens with all of us. If it happens once in a way, then this is possible as a human being, he made a mistake. But if it is happening consistently, and this is identified by the Muhaddasin that this narrator seems to have a lot of gaflat in narration. In his narration, they can see negligence. Then they identify him as a person of weak reliability in terms of zapt. Fourth, kathratul waham, having excessive doubts. He narrates a hadith and he says this was either like this or like that. Once in a way is okay. But frequently he says either this is like this or like that, like this or like that, like this or like that then this causes harm to his reliability and he is not considered very reliable because of this tasratul waham. It, it, we can see this in worldly matters. For example, if there is someone who is trying to help us, he says, okay, now this light is not working, I will just go up and I will try to fix it. He says, just check up, is the switch off? Now someone says, okay, yes, I, oh, it's off, go, 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 do it. Now when he is going to do, he says, no, no, it's on. No, no, it's off. On, off, on, off, 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 on, off. What will we do? Will say, he will say that, brother, I'll go and check myself. It should not be that this ends up being the last time I, I try to help someone. Uh, similarly, if we are traveling, we ask someone on a bus station that which bus will take me to this destination. Someone says, oh, it's either 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 or 15 or 19 or 20. It's either one of these buses, surely. Some doubt, major doubts. So we'll say, wait, I'll just rather myself check it. No, go, go by 15, no problem. Now, he's not sure about it. Now, how can we rely on him when he has doubts? So we all can understand this, but when it comes to the science of hadith, people say, no, Zaif hadith is also fine. Uh, hadith is weak, it's doubtful, no problem, you can accept it. But they won't accept that person on the bus station, nor will they accept that person about that electric switch. Amazing, isn't it? We go on to the fifth thing, Mukhalifatul Thiqat. If that narrator's narrations are consistently going against, against more reliable narrators, narrators with better grading in their preservation, Narrators which are larger in number, he is mukhalifatul thiqat. Then what happens? This causes jar, this causes injury to his preservation. People say his preservation, his preservation is not reliable because of his frequent mukhalifatul thiqat. If once in a way he is opposing, then a reliable narrator's hadith which opposes a narrator's hadith who is more reliable than him or more in number, this is considered shard as we discussed. But when his reliability goes down and uh, due to frequent opposition, finally his grading goes down and he's considered a weak narrator. And then after being weak, he goes against reliable narrators. Then his hadith is called munkar, rejected. Meaning he is not only weak, his hadiths are now level of munkar. My brothers and sisters, we have seen five reasons which Muhaddasin see to check the reliability of the hadith. Why did we see all this? We saw all this to be able to appreciate in a better manner how does a hadith reach the level of reliability being considered sahih and what is checked. We saw five conditions for grading a hadith sahih. The hadith should be muttasil, every narrator should be adil, he should be zabit, the hadith should not be shahs, it should not have any illat, it should not be mu'allal. So these were five conditions. We saw the five conditions of an adil narrator, of a religiously reliable narrator. He should have never lied in the name of the Prophet He should not be known to be a liar in worldly matters. He should not be a fasik or doer of major sins openly. He should not be an unknown narrator. We should not have jahala about him. And fifth, he should not be a person of bidah. 
narrating a hadith in support of his vida which no other reliable people have narrated. And five things which brings down their grading and they are not considered reliable or trustworthy. The first is that he should not be known to have bad memory, soul hives. He should not be known to make frequent mistakes. He should not be known to have fushul gafla, major negligence in narration of hadith. He should not be known to have kathratul waham, frequent excessive doubts. And he should not be known to have mukhalifat al-thiqat, opposition to reliable narrators. After seeing all of this, we just see that in terms of chains of narration, there are certain chains which have so many narrators at every single level, so many narrators. And these narrators are not from one area and one city and one town and one lane. They are from different, different parts of the Muslim world. So many narrators that it is not possible that all of these people must have got together and fabricated something. When there are large number of narrators, Muhadisin says that this hadith is the level of mutawatir. Mutawatir meaning every single level of that hadith has many narrators. Every single level. And they are from different, different cities for whom it was not possible to connect together and be able to fabricate. The number of these narrators depends on the situation. At times, it can be even be 40 or 10 or even 4 narrators at every single level that the expert muhaddis will decide whether this hadith is mutawatir or not. Now, whatever is not mutawatir is considered ahad. Ahad means anything less than mutawatir is called ahad. Ahadith are of three types. One is every single level has at least three narrators, at least three. Now, what is three and above but doesn't reach the level of mutawatir is considered mashhoor. If it has, every single level has at least two narrators, then this is called aziz. And every single level has one narrator and one has to be there, then this is called gharib. Now, can a ahad hadith, which is of the gharib level, meaning there's only one narrator narrating a hadith, is it possible to accept? Yes, if he's reliable. If he is reliable, it is acceptable. If there are two, but they are both liars, it is not acceptable. So this is only to describe the number of narrations, chains. If it reaches the level of mutawatir, that is surely acceptable. But all the ahad hadith will be accepted if the chain of narration consists of trustworthy people. Some people have come up with an understanding. They say ahad hadith where there is only one narrator is not acceptable. Uh, where is this from? We don't find any proof for this in the Quran and the Sunnah. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent one messenger. He didn't send two or three. The statement of one is acceptable. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa so many times sent single, single sahaba to preach and make knowledge reach people. He did not say the statement of one is not acceptable. And you know the famous incident where when the sahaba were reading, offering asr salah, and one single person who had prayed with Prophet Sallallahu he said, I testify that I prayed with the Prophet Sallallahu And the Qibla has been changed from Masjid Al-Aqsa to Masjid Al-Haram. And he testified to it and people changed in their Salah itself the Qibla. They did not say, you are just one man. The statement of one man is not acceptable. They did not say that. So even a single person's narration is acceptable, but he should be reliable. My brothers and sisters, before we finish, I want to share one more information. There are two types of Hasana hadith. One is Hasan li zatihi. Hasan, which is Hasan, the level of Hasan, due to its own self, li zatihi. It has all the conditions of a Sahih hadith, the five conditions, except that in Zopt, in the preservation, there is some slight weakness, but not the level of Zaif. Not the level to take the hadith to the level of Zaif weak. But I want to share something very important. There's another type of Hasan hadith, and that is Hasan li ghairihi. This is very, very beautiful. Hasan li ghairihi, a hadith reaches the level of Hasan li ghairihi if there is a zaif hadith, a weak hadith. There is some weakness in the narrator. He is not reliable, he is weak, but he is not a liar. And he is not very weak, not zaif jiddan. Some weakness, due to which the hadith has been graded as zaif. And now there is another narrator who is also having some weakness. He, this hadith is also some little zaif, little weakness, and this hadith is also the level of zaif. But both of them can strengthen each other and reach the level and become hasan li ghairihi. Hasan due to the support of someone else, ghair, meaning someone else has supported this hadith to reach the level of hasan. Wahadisin have applied the rule that if you don't find one male witness, then use two female witnesses. So they are counted as equal to one male. So they have used that rule to strengthen and bring this hadith 
where the doubt which existed with one narrator who is weak in memory, that doubt is removed when there is another narrator who is also having some weakness, but both of them together, it becomes Hassan Ligairi. Isn't this beautiful? So now when certain muhaddisin who have checked all the isnad, when they say this hadith is zaif, what they are really saying is that after combining all the chains of narration, the doubt continues to be there. That is why this hadith is not reaching the level of reliability, sahih or hasan, it continues to be zaif. Sahih is also of two types, sahih lizati, sahih ligairi, sahih due to its own self and sahih due to the support of someone else. Now what is this? How we saw zaif plus zaif reaches the level of hasan if the weakness is little. Similarly, if there are two hasana hadith, they both get together and it reaches the level of sahih and it is called sahih li ghairihi, sahih due to the support of someone else. Oh yes, we should also look at this. Mawzu, a fabricated hadith plus another fabricated hadith. Mawzu plus mawzu is what? Guess. Any guesses? It is mawzu. Zero plus zero and plus zero, 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 zero. It continues to be zero. Mawzu is a fabricated hadith. Even if ten liars get together, it is not going to increase the hadith in its level of acceptability and make it reach acceptability by many liars coming together. We have discussed this subject. I really hope that you have got started with this science. Now this much surely will not make you a muhaddis and it's not intended, but it is to appreciate and understand when scholars tell us this hadith is sahih due to this, this, this reason so that we can understand. However, my brothers and sisters, all said and done, some people still don't understand the subject and they argue, they say, no, it's at least hadith, a hadith. It is a hadith, so what if it is zaif? So what if it's fabricated hadith? It is a hadith. People don't understand. So now I want to share with you some hadith for these people who just can't understand and who insist that at least it is a hadith. We say, just look at this hadith. It's in Tabarani. Imam Tabarani has collected in Ausat. And remember, when the muhaddisin are collecting the chain of narration, they are doing a service to the science of hadith. They are doing a service by showing that this hadith is narrated by these kind of people. It is a service whereby people can see and understand, oh, this hadith comes from this chain of narration. It is not getting mingled and mixed up with the authentic chain of narration. So they are free. Man asnada faqad bariya. Whoever gives the chain of narration, he is free from blame. Now look at this hadith. This hadith says, Itta khizu biyad, Keep a white hen. For the house which has a white hen, shaitan or a magician cannot come into that house, nor can they come near that house. Will you follow this hadith? Another hadith recorded in Tabrani that the heat of Jahannam will be like the heat of the bathroom for my ummah. For the people of the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu the heat of Jahannam will be like the heat of the bathroom. Fabricated, fabricated hadith that... The hadith about the white hen, the hadith about the heat of Jahannam being like the heat of the bathroom, both are fabricated. Another example that if you see three things, three things help in increasing the strength of the eyes. Looking at green grass, looking at flowing water and looking at a beautiful face. Will you accept this hadith? No. Why? It's not authentic. That's what we've been telling you. All our hadiths are not authentic. Another example, Allah will not punish the ones with beautiful faces with the blackening of the face. Meaning Allah will not put them in Jahannam. Absolutely wrong. The right thing is Allah doesn't look at your face and your bodies. He looks at our hearts and our deeds. Another hadith recorded by Imam Bahaki in Shobul Iman, which says, whoever abuses the Arabs, he is from the mushriks. Hadith is fabricated. Mawzu, all of these are mawzu hadith. They are not authentic. They are not authentic. We don't accept them. Another hadith which says loving the cat is a part of Iman. Do we accept this? No. Another hadith which says whoever does, doesn't have money to do sadaqah, he should curse the Jews. Another hadith, a child who is born out of adultery, he will not enter into paradise and nobody from his lineage will enter into paradise until seven generations. Absolutely wrong. Fabricated hadith. All of these hadiths, muhaddisin have identified, they are fabricated hadiths. Now, we all are on the same page, I hope. My brothers and sisters, the final conclusion of this entire session is that we have the ahadith as the second primary source of Islam. Our deen comes from the Quran and from the hadith. We accept the hadith, but just as gold 
is checked by those who are experts, the goldsmiths, who know how to check the gold and tell us that this is 24 carat, or this is 16 carat, and this glitters, but it's not gold. Now, we all are smart and wise in worldly matters. People know, yes, this is pure gold, this is fake. Nobody gets cheated with this except the fools. Normally, people don't get cheated in this. They are smart. In business, they are smart. When they go out to buy something, they are smart. When they go to the supermarket, they are smart. They know how that, yes, I have to check the expiry date. Why? Money is precious. Don't waste your money. But the same people when it comes to religion, why is it that people don't check up? They just don't check up. They just want to accept everything or as a shortcut, another shortcut, just reject everything. Both are wrong. The right way is in between, uh, brothers and sisters. If the knowledge which you have comes from authentic sources, if you know how to check it, when we drink water, we check up, this is pure water, it should not be dirty, it should be clean, so that my health doesn't get spoiled. If you take knowledge from mixed sources, your knowledge is going to get mixed up, your deen is going to get mixed up. So my brothers and sisters, beware of this. Beware, they should not be able to misguide us. They should not be able to put us in fitna. It is important that we check the authenticity of what comes to us from the hadith. We should understand the science. We should know when the scholars of hadith speak. We should be able to appreciate the beauty of our religion, how Allah has preserved, how Allah took service from the imams of hadith and how they serve this religion by preserving and passing on information about all of these narrators of hadith. We seek Allah's help and guidance. May Allah make us of those who recognize the truth and follow it and pass it on to others. Ameen wa akhir dawana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah. This series is sponsored by one of our brother in Islam for Sadqai Jariya of his family. Aise hi aur videos banane mein hamari madad karein. 